When it comes to anchoring, one of the many benefits of technology is Google Earth. Used in tandem with a suitable chart, it's the absolute business when it comes to checking out a likely berth when your hoary old pilot book is so out of date it was probably ordered by Noah in his youth. This afternoon I've flashed up Castro Urdiales just west of Bilbao in the eastern corner of the Bay of Biscay. I was saddened to see that moorings have proliferated inside the long breakwaters with the eternal Biscay swell clearly reaching the outer rows. This now means that any cruising mariner who shapes up for the ancient Knights Templar's church on the hill expecting a peaceful night on the hook is doomed instead to roll his stick out until morning. On my first visit many years ago, the only moorings were for a small fleet of ethnic fishing boats tucked away at the top of the harbour. We dropped the hook late in the afternoon, comfortably back from these, and went ashore at sunset to walk cobbled streets under the castle, filled with people bent on a quiet night out. There was no drunken shrieking or mindless muzak. The only sound was the thrum of human voices echoing back from the high shuttered houses. Sleep came easily that night and with the bulk of the town between us and any weather that might be brewing, any suggestion of setting an anchor watch would probably have been rubbished. Anchor watches are rare birds on my boat, probably because my ground tackle has largely held fast since I let go on a coral reef early in 1976. That boat had no engine, so anchor and hope was the final solution. The wind had gone absent without leave and it was last chance saloon. We dragged. The rest is best forgotten, but I learnt a sharp lesson about holding ground. Back in Castro, I rowed ashore in the morning with two shipmates looking for bread. Returning to the ship with the goods, we passed a modern 40-foot yacht tugging at a skinny anchor rope in a stiffening morning breeze. She was lying well inshore and upwind of us. Her decks were festooned with washing lines on which a nubile young woman was pegging out the smalls. Although she was engaged in this most, mund most mundane of tasks, the lads appreciated her in a seaman-like manner. They got no encouragement, though, only a cheery wave. Clambering on board our boat a few minutes later, we handed the bread below and were following it down the hatch when the forty-footer came by, beam on to the wind, dragging her anchor at a lively pace. The washing had moved up a gear and now featured shirts and sheets ballooning in the breeze. The windage was like the side of a boatyard shed, but the girl was hanging up yet another load, blissfully unaware that she was on a one-way trip back to the Bay of Biscay. We hailed across, but whoever was in charge over there, it certainly wasn't her. She'd no idea what to do. Like a true gallant, I stayed on board to lay out the breakfast while my two shipmates piled back into the tender and set off in pursuit, oars going like the paddle wheels of the old Birkenhead ferry. Ten minutes later they'd re-anchored her more or less on the spot she'd recently vacated. Her skipper had, it seemed, gone ashore in search of a chandler, having recognised that his ground tackle fell short of the ideal. He'd pitched up in his tender with a 20 kilogram Bruce and some chain, just as my crew were shutting down his engine. The boys were rewarded with a bottle of Bodega Collapso, but the lady blew them a kiss as she and her other half sailed out later in the day with the washing duly dried and stowed. Given a sheltered anchorage and good holding ground, successful anchoring depends on three things which the washerwoman's old man did not have. <clears throat> what he lacked was the biggest anchor he could stow, lots of the beefiest chain he could deal with, and a sound technique for digging in the ironmongery. Of course, weight isn't everything, and it helps if the anchor's a proper job. An authentic example of any modern penetrating anchor will serve well, Spade, Rockner and their friends are tending to take over from the well-tried CQR and Bruce, but I've found no reason to quarrel with either of the traditional standbys. In my youth, swashbuckling around in the tropics on boats up to 38 feet, I lay for hundreds of nights on 35-pound CQRs with plenty of 3 8 chain. I don't doubt the magazine tests which tell us the new types are even better, but I certainly wouldn't discount their forebears. Whatever its manufacture, however, the hook must be genuine. There are some shockers out there made in odd places on the planet, not noted for quality of workmanship, and I'll never forget pulling up a Danforth look-alike to find one of the flukes bent over backwards. I've never given a cheap anchor deck space since. And the same goes for chain cable. 
Once, down by Rio, I was anchored on a lee shore in a hard gale alongside a South African yacht. Don't ask why. The decision involved a very good party that had sapped our judgement. My neighbour was a farmer, and he'd used what looked like a decent enough agricultural chain he'd had galvanised. It snapped. I could hear the bang from my own foredeck. He started his engine and managed to work out to seawards in safety, but it had been a close-run thing. As for anchoring on rope, plenty of people do this, and there are arguments in favour of it, particularly on world cruises where sea room in the anchorage is no problem. But I'd demand at least 10 metres of chain at the outboard end to help set the pick and minimise chafe from the seabed. Boats on rope surge around, and I've seen a gravelly seabed saw through a rope in a night. Never believe that the ground tackle a yacht manufacturer supplies will be adequate. It might be, but I've rarely come across a production boat with anything useful in the locker. My own 44 footer displaces round 11 tonnes. Her bower is a 30 kilogram Bruce and I carry 45 fathoms, that is about 90 metres to you, of 3 8 inch chain, that's verging on 10 millimetres. I wouldn't want to go to sea with anything lighter, would you? For coastal work in summer, I could probably get by with a smaller hook, but there seems little point. Like most of us with a boat my size, I have a windlass on the foredeck and a bow roller that carries the big Bruce with ease. The bow doesn't sit down on her marks, so why should I settle for less? Digging in the picks the crunch. A scope of three or four to one on the expected maximum depth is usually enough, but if you have a windlass and plenty of room, you might as well lay more. Here's what we do on my boat. I'm on the foredeck, my wife is aft, steering and running the engine. In theory, I should lower the anchor under control. Well, that would be nice, wouldn't it, with a modern two-way windlass, but it's never going to happen for me. My windlass only heaves chain in, so all I can do is let off the brake and watch from a safe distance as the chain rattles away as though I'd no windlass and had flaked the cable out on deck instead. The plan is to lay the cable along the bottom in as straight a line as possible. In a set piece, when the weather's calm, I snub the windlass when the anchor hits the floor, then ease the brake as my wife motors slowly astern. More usually it's breezy, so we forget any such finesse. We don't fight the boat, we just let the bow blow away. When the required length of cables run, I snub it, take off power, and if we've been motoring astern, let the boat's way manage the next bit. She variably brings up soon, because either the anchor is getting a bite, or friction is holding her up as the chain drags on the bottom. Now we go slow astern again, communicating by hand signals so as not to wake the whole roadstead with shouted orders. The boat gathers way, then falters, which means she's now dragging in the hook. We keep the engine gently in gear astern while I find a beam transit of any two objects lined up. This is the only sure method of knowing that way is finally lost with the engine still engaged. When we're happy that the anchor is holding, she raises the revs significantly, that's my wife, and holds half astern while we carry on eyeballing the transit. It may drift a tad to start with, but if all's well, it'll soon come right again. All this activity literally works the anchor flukes deep into the seabed. If the hook holds with this amount of power on, it's going to take more than a gust of wind to pull it out. Once we're satisfied, the revs come off slowly so that the boat doesn't bounce back over the anchor. Then we set the riding light and we settle in. When it blows hard, I know I'm totally secure and I spare a thought for that lovely girl dragging her anchor as she pegged out her frilly undies. <laughs>